You know, this song is really growing on me. You? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, here comes the best part. Listen, listen. He wants. And every time, too. Okay, got the eggnog and Mr. Rummy. Let's hit the Christmas presents. Speaking of which, still enjoying the Duschenberger, Douglas? Oh, yeah. It's nice having a car I can take into the store with me. Here you go, Daddy. This is from Doug and me. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Ooh, ooh. What could it be? It's so exciting. <laughs> What's this? It's a watch. I have a watch. I know, but this is engraved. Look. With all our love, Doug and Karen. Mm -hmm. Well, you did your best. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matty Towers. I'm one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. I want to welcome you to our Messed Up Christmas series, where the motto is, it doesn't matter how hard you try or you try your best, someone will always screw it up for you. Um, one thing before we jump into our conversation um, is I want to clarify something and let people know um, that the decorations for our Christmas series are intentional. Um, we've had an amazing amount of people, dozens of people, who have asked if they can please straighten the tree that's in the, uh, the welcome area, or if they can even give us money so we can buy a proper tree with some proper decorations. As I want to let you know, it's intentional. We, we, we commissioned a team to be able to do our decorations that would fit with our teaching series of A Messed Up Christmas. To challenge us, not just as we, we talk about and have conversations, but also visually. I mean, what... What do we really think is beautiful about Christmas? Is it that everything is, is serene and, and pretty and meticulous? And in that, are we missing the, the, the true reason that Christmas is a beautiful thing? Because as we look at the Christmas series that we're going through, A Messed Up Christmas, we've been having conversations so far about why it's not such a, a clean and meticulous story as we might have had it once portrayed to us as a child, but it is instead really messed up with Honestly, some situations we can relate to. So we're going through this series of intentionality, so please don't try and straighten it. Um, but if you want to give us some money to buy a new one, we'll just take your money. Um, one of the things we're doing in this season that we do every Christmas season as a church family is we, we want Christmas to mean something, to have a real impact and we want it to change lives. So we, we started the My Christmas Epiphany Initiative, something that we would engage in as a church family that would change something for somebody somewhere in our community or across the world that lets them, show, lets them know that they're loved, loved by us and loved by God. And this year, we are engaging to do something a little bit different with our My Christmas Epiphany in that we want to be able to equip our people, we want to equip the church family to be able to personally go into people's lives and to help them when they're in a mess, when they've got difficulty, when they've got problems. Allow me to let our uh, ministry coach of the Love People Fund, Jeff Lund, explain a little bit more. My name is Jeff Lund, and I am the coach of the Love People Fund. What this is, is a um, fund that we are putting together that is going to be used to help people in need. If you know a family that's went through a hardship and their needs are um, great and you only have you know, a small amount of money to help them, um, you come to us and we can um, match up to $250. So you could give a gift of $500 to help that family in need. To find out more, come find me or Brian German, and we'll help you um, meet that need. My name is Jeff, and this is my ministry. So the reason that we're engaging in, in the idea of establishing this fund is because, especially at Christmas time, we, we start to notice as a church how there are so many needs going unmet and so many situations which we would love to be able to love somebody financially 
and we just don't have the resources for it. That's why we say we're not going to spend a lot of money on decorations. We'd rather put it into people's lives to show people that we don't care so much about what's going on inside this building as what's going on out there, and that to equip our family to be able to go and do that, to show people that someone cares, and eventually maybe that God cares. So what I'm asking everyone to do this year is to consider to giving a small amount to the Love People Fund so that someone in the future who sees that need in another person's life, it might well be you, is ready and equipped to go to be able to be matched so we can make a huge impact in their life. Whether you can give five bucks or 250 and sponsor the future uh, blessing of someone's family or somebody's life, we would love you to engage in that challenge this year. As when it comes to always giving at Epiphany Station, give in one of three ways. We have the red boxes at the back of the room in the corner there, and they're for anything that's paper. We have a tablet with a card reader for plastic, and we have everything digitally online at epiphanystation.com. And if you want to earmark it for the Love People Fund from today into the future, you just let us know in the memo. Also, if you want to give at Epiphany for your financial offering to God or your gift to the mission and vision of what we're engaged in here, you can use those same three things. But as we step into this idea of a love people fund, I want you to know and understand that this could be the reason that people understand that they're cared about. They could start to see the church differently and therefore start to see God differently, that he cares about what's going on in their lives and that you could be the person that gets to step into that and give them that message. So as we continue our teaching series and and the message this week, we engage in this idea that we've been told a Christmas story that is a little bit nicer and prettier and less gross than it actually is. And last week we talked about how Mary's predicament of becoming pregnant before she was married was not just a little inconvenient, but it was instead life-threatening. And we talked about how her situation it made everything difficult, but God was able to use that and with a messed up reputation do something with it. And today we're going to talk about how through a messed up power paradigm, how the use of the weak thing can be used to show God's power and his glory. Today we're going to talk about, I think, the the messiest part of the story, the grossest, the smelliest part of the story, because it involves babies. And babies are gross and smelly. Amen. Not not so many. Not so many. Groans. Uh, (laughs) Who here has a baby currently? or has once had a baby, or knows somebody who's had a baby, or once was a baby, or knows somebody who once was a baby. Perfect. So we all know what a baby is, and babies are messy. They are kind of gross, and if you just be honest, when my child was first born, my my first born of the, the litter, shall we say, it came out purple and rubbery and gross, covered in white stuff and goo. It was gross. And then you have to like deal with the first diaper change, which you have an idea of what it's going to be. But you remember the first diaper change, and it's black? Black tar... And I'm sorry to ruin this for future parents, so people are looking forward to that day. Just goo. It's just disgusting. And then there's the first time that your baby gets into something. You know when they get into something, like, and it's the world's most misleading phrase, because they actually don't get into something, they bring that something out into the world. They might get into flour or glue or glitter, but that's not where it's staying, is it? It's going everywhere. It's going abroad for the whole world to see that I'm here and I can ruin your day in an instant because I'm a baby. I love babies, genuinely. But when you look at them, you've got to think to yourself, why is it that they don't develop like other animals? Like you take foals, you know, baby horses, and, and they're born and they can walk almost instantly take sea turtles, you know, they're buried underground, and then they they come out of their eggs, and they know already to make a beeline for the ocean, so they're walking and swimming day one. Chickens and a lot of other birds will actually be able to start communicating with their mother while they're still in the egg, and ours, in the meantime, are just kicking the living daylights out of our mothers for months. Our babies, they arrive in this world so very messy, so very vulnerable, unable to do some of the most simple things. They're just kind of wobbling around for a year or so, and then they start to yammer for a year or so, and then they sass you for 16 more years. And that's why God makes them so darn cute, so that you'll keep them alive. But it's with these jiggling balls of mess that God decides to declare his presence on earth in the Christmas story. It's through babies through the very weakest, very messiest version of us that God brings forth hope into the world. He doesn't use the the big and the brave and the strong and the wise and the smart. He brings vulnerability and he brings messiness and he brings weakness 
to be able to display power. And when I say babies, I do mean babies, plural, because often when we think of the Christmas story, you know, we think of the one baby, you know, Jesus. We think of baby Jesus who never cried and never pooped and never bit his mom while nursing, like that never happened. But there's another baby. There's another baby in the story that precedes Jesus in all sorts of ways, and he's actually used to be able to tell that Jesus is coming and to help people understand what's going on. This is the story of John, the story of John the Baptist. As we start into the Bible this morning, we have a stack of Bibles out by the Next Step Station. If you don't have one, please grab one on your way out today. Otherwise, text to me on the screens behind me. But in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5, this is the backstory. It says, when Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, carefully, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, here's something I want you to notice. I want you to notice a pattern that starts in the announcement of John. Because one thing that we already notice in this situation is they can't have kids, but we know John is going to exist. So something's going to have to shift and happen. And, and it points us in the direction not just of what happens, but how God decides to do it, how he communicates he's going to do things. So we start off with mommy and dad. From this point forward, we'll call them Zach and Liz because it's just easier. So we start with Zach and Liz the Baptist, which I assume is their last name. And in this situation, I've already been told they can't conceive. They can't have children. And the situation for what they want to develop, they want kids, is impossible. The situation is impossible. If you're a note taker, write that down. The situation is impossible. So continuing on in verse 11, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Now, as with all things we read in the Bible, it should always beg the question, why? Why, why is this happening? Why is God involved in this? Why, in, in, in any shape or form, with the birth of this one human being in the history of mankind, is it not done just normally? Why is it just not conceived by a younger couple? Why instead does God decide that he's going to do something miraculous? Why in a position that is impossible, a situation that is powerless, does he intend to show how powerful he is? Because if you put everything else away from the Bible, like you don't believe any of it, but you hear that once there was a declaration that a barren woman was going to have a child, and then she did, that should make us pay attention. That should mean something is now undeniable about the nature of whoever gave that message and whoever promised that pregnancy, they know something. So God steps into these situations and say, look, I'm going to see this, this barren woman be pregnant, and if she does get pregnant, then you have to understand that I was involved. At that point, God has to be, in some degree, a little bit undeniable. If he predicts it and promises it and guarantees it and makes the impossible possible, God is on display. God shows that he can make the impossible possible. Jot that one down. God makes the impossible possible. And Zechariah responds. In verse 18, Zechariah responds. It says, he says to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. There's two amazing things going on in here. The first and most important we'll get to. The second is that Zechariah doesn't lose his head in the situation. Still faced with an angel, still having that conversation, he still has the wherewithal and the wisdom not to call his wife old. He still sees this as an opportunity for him to earn some husband points and not get in trouble. And he responds, I'm super old. My wife, she's just, you know, well along in years. And in that moment, Zechariah's response is what? Skepticism. He's skeptical. The angel is promising something, and, and Zechariah's response is like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. How can I know that this will even happen? Because if you see the actual situation, it doesn't look possible. So here's one thing that we can take as Zechariah gets to make his response in skepticism. 
that it would appear that God is okay with some skepticism, that God is still going to work in skepticism. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to have faith based on faith, that He doesn't want us to believe in Him and love Him without signs and wonders and miracles and displays of His power. He does. But He also seems to respond to the skeptic with patience. And to those who are struggling to to believe or to see it and to know that God is who God is, He responds by saying, okay, let me show you something. Let me display something for you that should be undeniable. If your wife gets pregnant, Zechariah, you have to admit I'm in that in some degree. He has patience for the skeptic. What apparently he doesn't have patience for is us burying our heads in the sand when his power is on display. Because when you look at the situation in essence, what's happening is a messenger of God himself is standing before Zechariah. As it goes on, it says, look, I'm the angel Gabriel. I just came from God's presence. What I'm telling you is going to happen. And Zechariah's like, hmm, are you sure? And in that, the angel responds and says, you have no idea. You know what's going to happen now? You're not going to be able to talk for nine months. You're going to shut your mouth. You're going to shut up and you're going to look and you're going to listen and you're going to wait and see that God is God and see that he has power to make the impossible possible. Now, we all have different reasons for burying our head in the sand. I understand the skeptic a lot more because I am one. But when we bury our heads in the sand, there's only a couple of reasons we will ever do that. The first is fear. You bury your head in the sand over anything, it's out of fear that what is contrary to what you believe could be true. When you bury your head in the sand about religion or politics or social economics or anything, and you just bury your head and know what I know is what I know and I can have no input from anywhere else, when you do that, you're declaring you're afraid of what could also be true. You're afraid of the difference. You're afraid of the possibility. In this instance, the fear that God could be true. That could be, he could be truer than you want him to be. He could be more real than you want him to be. He could be more involved in the world and its workings than we want him to be. So either we bury our head out of fear or we bury it out of doubt. That I am, I am too doubtful. I have too many concerns. I have too many objections. I'm not going to entertain this any further, because what if it's true? And what if my concerns and my objections and my beliefs are wrong? See, what's beautiful about the skeptic in this story is he gets to respond. And what's beautiful about the Christmas story is it's built so that we get to respond. (coughs) Jot that down. When situations are impossible and God makes the impossible possible, we get to respond. Now, if we shift gears here just a little bit, and we step away from Zechariah and Elizabeth and and John, we move into the more well-known story of Jesus. I want you to take notice of the similarities. Starting off in verses 26 through 33, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. A woman without a child, an angel delivering a message, initial confusion and fear. The similarities in the story can't be ignored. And what we find is here another impossible situation. Mary can't be pregnant. I mean, the reason that Elizabeth couldn't be pregnant was age. The reason that Mary can't be pregnant is there's a certain other mechanic missing in the conception process. But it's still the same. It's not possible. The other shift and difference we see in this is The birth of John the Baptist is in response to what? Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayers. I don't think Mary was busy praying for a son or a child before she was married so she could be looked at with scorn. I don't think that's on her prayer list. Instead, what we find is this is a response to the prayers of hundreds and thousands of people for decades and centuries that God's son would come to earth, that there would be a Messiah. 
So there's similarities and there's difference, but Mary's response is all too similar to Zechariah's. In verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. She clarifies the situation just in case the angel's not clear on this. This can't happen. The angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he'll be called the Son of God. In response to Mary's skepticism, first off the angel says, look, God has power. The power of God is going to make this happen. He's going to conceive life where you think it's inconceivable. And then he says something else right after that I think is the definitive moment in this chunk of text as to why Zechariah and Elizabeth and John and why Mary and Joseph and Jesus and why us. Whenever I'm reading the Bible, there seems to always be that moment in which I'm reading a chunk of text and then there's just like a word or a couple of words that everything else seems to hinge on, and it clarifies and it highlights what God's really communicating, aside from just a nice story. And that's what the angel says next. In verse 36, he says, the power of the Most High is going to give you a son, and what's more? And what's more? To say, and also, and you know what else is happening, and you know what else God is doing? What's more, Elizabeth, your relative in her old age, has conceived a child. People said she was barren. People said it was impossible. But you know what? She's six months into her pregnancy, for with God, nothing is impossible. This what's more is that moment where we start to understand that the birth of John the Baptist, the conception of John the Baptist, the life of John the Baptist is going to be used by God to point people towards Jesus, even Mary. In Mary's skepticism and and, and inability to believe in those moments, he says, look, you know what's more? Look over here at your relative Elizabeth, where people said what was impossible has been made possible. How does she respond? And you see that everything that has been done in prefacing Gabriel's conversation with Mary has been done so that Mary could see, so that Mary could respond. And as we look at the Christmas story and we think, Why so much mess? Why so many unattainable, impossible situations? Why so many miracles? Why so many supernatural things? Why couldn't they just have made this like a normal story with normal people getting normal pregnant, normal poop, normal crying? Why is it so different? Because the very essence of the the conception and birth of these two babies was to declare to us that something is going on beyond the normal. Something that has power in the powerlessness. And as Zechariah and, and Elizabeth and John were to point and help Mary look at Jesus, so is Mary's pregnancy. So is Jesus' miraculous birth. It would point us to understanding what's going on. That the impossible is made possible. That, that we might be able to see now what Mary sees. Because after, after the angel says, you know, look even your, your relative Elizabeth... Mary responds differently. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. When we look at the Christmas story and we we remove the unfathomable, when we remove the miraculous, we remove what God is truly trying to communicate. The impossible made possible. Powerlessness filled with power. And in that we remove the opportunity for us to respond. Because for us to respond to a God that is all-powerful, we need to see that power. That's our problem. That's our deficiency. And when Mary saw it, she was able to respond and say, look, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be all in. I'm ready to follow. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to put it all on the line. Do whatever it is you need to do. May the things that you've said about me come true. I'm all in. Because she saw this display of power to help her see. I believe every single piece of this is intentional. I think every single thing that God did in the development of John and the development of Jesus was so that you and I could understand what's really going on in the Christmas story. And we could take steps to understand what our story is and how we relate to God in His story. There are a couple of things that I want us to do this week as we think about engaging in any sort of relationship with God or taking further steps. Two steps. Just two for us to take as we engage with this, this communication through the Christmas story. The first seems very simple, but it's a huge challenge, and it's a commitment. The first 
step that you can take is to look, simply to look, because most people don't and won't look. To look for what God is actually doing, to look and see that He is at work. Far too many of us spend our lives with our heads buried in the sand. We don't want to look. We don't want to see that God is true. We don't want to see that God's ways are right. We don't want to see that He's got a plan and expectations. But you know what? If you were to take the whole Bible and read every account of everything He's ever said or done, anything that people have ever claimed was from God or with God, you would see that it was just a display He put on to help people believe. His account of creation, the splitting of seas, fire from heaven, water from rocks, leprosy and blindness and infertility healed, death reversed, all of it, why? So that we could see that God is beyond us, that He is more powerful, and we would respond to that. That we would look at the Bible not just as, oh, this is a great book, but we would look at it as the events in it are great. What God has recorded for us to understand and hear and see are great, that we would be in awe of what He's done over millennia for us to be able to look and see God has been making the impossible possible for longer than you can even imagine so that you would be able to notice something. So where are you not looking? Where is it that things in your life have just become expected? Where is your head buried in the sand where you don't see God working the impossible out into possibility? What do you have that is in your life that is so messed up and jacked up that you doubt he could even touch it? Is it your marriage? Is it the the closest relationship we can have as human beings is so distorted, so jacked up, so messed up, there's no way God has the power to fix that? Is it your finances? Are you circling the drain? Are you barely making it by? Do you not know where food's coming from? Do you not know where bills are going to get paid? Is there a situation with your money where you're thinking to yourself, there's no way God could touch that? Is it with your life? Is it with your priorities? Is it with your work? Is it with your purpose? What area of your life feels so locked in, feels so unmovable, unshiftable, so impossible that you are just going to put up with it? Because that is not what God is trying to tell you through the Christmas story. He's not trying to tell you that some people have it perfect, and if you're not perfect, you're screwed, and he doesn't love you. What he's trying to tell you is it's always jacked up. It's always going to be messed up, and he wants to be the one to show you it's fixed. He wants to be the one to put power on display. He wants to do that so we will be driven to a response. If we will take our eyes and we will focus them upwards and see that God can fix and will fix and do things not just through the Bible, not centuries ago, but today. In his church, outside of his church, in the streets, in our hospitals, in our prisons, that God is at work, that he's doing miraculous things like changing hearts and healing bodies and changing mindsets that we look over time and time again. As we choose to look this week, I want to challenge you to do two practical things. Two practical things every day for one week. It's not such a big one, but... We'll see. The first is, I want you to, to get a Bible. If you don't have one, like I said, there are the next step stations, a free gift. And I want you to read Luke chapter one and two. Shouldn't take too long. I just have my wife read it to me because I'm not a good reader. But just read one and two and see how many times God unnecessarily does the supernatural. How there could be a normal reason for someone getting pregnant or someone being talked to or communicated, but instead, there are so many miracles, so many displays of power in just two short chapters of the Bible, and why that happens so often and so much. To understand why God is trying to display His power through this moment in history. And the second thing I want you to do, and this is maybe even a bigger step, is I want you to ask God, whether you believe in Him or not, skeptical or not, ask Him to show you something this week, to show you his power to redeem something, to fix something that you deem unfixable, that if he does get involved, will make it undeniable that he was there. To picture that and to pray for that and to see God work this week or next week or next month or next year, but to pray for it now and then to wait and to look. As we look through the Bible, as we look at God making 
a baby in a barren womb and a virgin womb. It would all be so that we would be driven to response, that Zechariah, that Mary would respond to what God can do. And this is our second step. If our first is to look, our second is to respond to what we see. And if we see what God is doing, if we can see that he has power, that he brings hope to the hopeless and purpose to the purposeless and love to the unlovable, that we would respond in the way that he's just calling his kids to respond, that we respond with love and with trust and with worship, that as we look for God abroad, as we look for him at home, that we get this opportunity now to respond. As Zechariah kind of jacked up his first response, he gets a second opportunity. Nine months Later, after his first interaction, his son is born, and his voice returns, and he makes a declaration about his boy. In Luke 1, verse verse, uh, 76, Zechariah says to his newborn son, you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in shadow of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. What God wants us to understand, what Zechariah finally understood, is what was coming was light to the darkness. To any dark and broken and jacked up situation, God was ready to bring light And he was desirous to bring a path to peace for every single person that would look for it. If you can see that, how will you respond? How have you responded in the past? How will you respond differently? If you can't see that, have you ever asked yourself why? Are you a natural skeptic that wants to see more before you respond? Or is your head in the sand? I want to give you a chance to think about this and an opportunity to respond today. No matter where you're at, I want you to respond no matter what your thoughts are about God, the Bible, Christ, and the Christmas story. I want you to respond in some fashion. As you walked in this morning, you were given a connection card. It's one of these yellow cards that we use to be able to communicate at Epiphany Station. Today, we're gonna use them for something special as we did in our first experience. As I want you to use this to communicate what you're thinking, what you're feeling, about your belief that God has power and how you're gonna respond to that. If you have doubt, if you have concerns, if you have objections, I want you to take a minute and I want you to write that down on here. I want you to put pen to paper of what your objections are, what God would need to do to show you that he's powerful, to show you that he's true, to show you that he's real. If you do see this, but you, you do see that God is powerful, but you've never responded, I want you to look for a way to respond. If you see it, and you've never wanted to start and never have started a relationship with Christ, I want you to choose to make that decision today. If you are looking to to recommit your life or you need to make a different step in your walk with Christ or your relationship with God, I want you to make that commitment today. If you're ready to publicly declare that you want to follow Jesus Christ and declare before God that you'll put it all down to follow Him, I want you to make the commitment to be baptized today. If you're ready to get involved in the mission of serving other people, outsiders who don't know that they're loved and that our God has power, I want you to make that commitment today. And then here's what I want you to do with these. And this is why I want every single person to fill one out. Because very soon here, we're going to take communion together. And the reason that we're going to take communion is because as we think, as we consider making any response to God, we need to make that response with the right mindset. And the mindset is that any relationship we get to have with God is based on sacrifice. Christmas to us, for whatever it means, meant sacrifice to God. It meant sacrifice to Jesus. It meant sacrifice to John and Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. It meant sacrifice for them all. So that we could be pointed to this chance, this change, this offer of relationship through Jesus Christ. So as we come up and we take communion together, or even not take communion together, I want you to bring your response. You see, the way we take communion is you can take it whenever you wish. We head down the center aisle and we have two stations for communion on the corners of the stage. You can come forward, you can grab that, take it back to your seat whenever you want. But even if you're not planning to take communion today, I want you to bring 
your, your response with you. And either just lay that down and walk on, I'll lay that down and take communion with you back to your seat. The team's going to lead us through a worship song to give us time to think about this, time to, to make our objections clear, to make our commitments clear, an opportunity to respond. Because God has said a lot about himself for a long time. He's also said a lot about you. And he said a lot about your future and what he wants to do so that we might be able to respond as Mary once did and say, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. If you wish, would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank you for moving uh, and, and, and doing something about our relationship with you. I thank you that we can know and own the fact that you're working in here today that you're, 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 you're working on thoughts and, and, and feelings in us as we respond and think about this offer and this opportunity for relationship. I thank you that you're patient with us, that you're merciful in our doubts and our skepticism because this world is messy and sometimes it sucks and it doesn't seem like you're in control. It doesn't seem like you have power. But allow us to look. Help us to get our head out of the sand so even when we consider the things that we haven't asked for, but we would see you at work. We'd see you doing the miraculous so that we would be able to understand our place in your story. God, help for those of us for are on the fence about our relationship with you. We would see what you have done for us personally and be ready to start that, to ready to start that conversation with all our concerns and doubts and objections in tow. We thank you, God, that you are a God of relationship and redemption, and that's what Christmas is all about. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.